Well, I understand, uh, I think I understand the biomedical appeal, the scientific appeal, uh -huh. the technological appeal, but the philosophical <laughs> appeal, why you are pursuing this, is, is still intrigues me. Look, one way to think of it would be that, that the traditional questions that philosophers have wanted to answer from Plato on have had to do with the nature of knowledge and the nature of consciousness. And I'm assuming that if we do understand the brain, we will understand the nature of knowledge, learning, memory, and so on, and uh, that we will understand the nature of consciousness, of how it's possible that you can take just a brain, <laughs> just, just a brain, a brain. Uh, and yet it has awareness, and yet it can introspect, and yet it can talk. But what comes to mind is, is are we just the activity of molecules? Are we just molecules in motion? Is this inquiry leading us to think of ourselves as just primarily or essentially or just uh, material? Yes. When I say that the mind is the brain, when I say that vision just is a function of the brain, that's what I mean. That there, are, there is nothing other than the cells and the way they're put together. Now, it's hard to see, in a way, how it is. You look at a cell under a microscope, and you say, how could that thing have anything to do with my feeling pain or my seeing a color? Or my falling in love. Yes. Two things, I think, need to be said about that. And first of all, the, the first thing that needs to be said is, of course, it isn't an individual neuron that does it. It isn't an individual neuron that feels pain. It's a whole interactive set of neurons that do. Um, and similarly with falling in love. I mean, it isn't that there's one little neuron out there in the parietal cortex that says, oh, you know, uh, you know this is the real thing. It, it, obviously, it can't be like that. So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is this, that I think, you know, with regard to understanding the, the neurobiological basis for psychological functions, like falling in love and seeing, we're sort of a bit like where Aristotle was with respect to understanding the nature of motion. And we've got a long, long way to go. And just as for Aristotle, for example, it would be impossible to imagine uh, a space that wasn't Euclidean, a space that had a shape and that was deformed by large gravitational masses. So we might say, God, it's impossible to imagine how, you know, the redness of an apple, the seeing of the redness of an apple could be caused by or could be identical with the behavior of a set of neurons. But the important thing is this, we mustn't let our own failures of imagination tell us what must be the case in the universe. One of the things I must say that has impressed me rather a lot um, was this. A number of months ago, um, I, amongst a few other neuroscientists, was asked to give a tutorial on the brain to the Dalai Lama. And the explanation was that he was simply very interested, that he wanted to know about the kinds of things that we were working on, and he wanted to understand in order to you know, think about things more wisely. And so we had uh, had a meeting in, in Newport Beach. Now, the thing that I thought was profoundly interesting about the Dalai Lama was this. He had no dogma. He was willing to change his mind about anything depending on the nature of the evidence. And on certain occasions, he did. Um, and that he seemed to take as the most important aspect of his religious, um, of, 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 of the religion of Buddhism, to have to do with questions of how to live a life. And there he talked about compassion, and he talked about honesty, and so forth. But he didn't advert to any dogmas about the nature of the universe, about whether the Earth is in, is, is in the center of the solar system, or about whether species were created, or whether there was a mind independent of the body, and so on. He said, if those are the facts, those are the facts.
minutes. What did you think when you came away from from the well, session with him? What I thought was important was that on issues of science, of issues of the nature of the universe, he wanted information from the people who knew or the people who had the most information available. And he was not going to insist that the universe be one way because the Buddhists had thought that for the last 2,000 years. So it seemed to me this kind of separation of matters of fact on the one hand and matters of morals on the other hand was really quite important. And it would not relieve us from the necessity of constructing ethical ways of dealing with one another. Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all very much open. And uh, I don't think that discovering things about the way the brain works is going to tell us what sort of moral system is, is most appropriate. Now, it might tell us some things that bear upon that. In other words, it might give us facts about that that would be relevant. Such as? Um, well, about the kinds of flexibility people do and don't have in molding their character or the kinds of, or, or in making difficult decisions in, as it were, weakness of will. The limits of free will. Yeah. I think it might be very helpful with regard to those kinds of things. But, but we would still have to reason together and make a decision about what to do with that knowledge. What does this do to the religious philosophers who write about God breathing into the clay the spirit of mm -hmm. life, the soul of, of, of life, to mm -hmm. the religious idea of mm -hmm. the soul? Do you think that's just a metaphor? I don't think it can be accurate. And even talking about goal, God breathing life into something, we now know, of course, that life isn't like that either. Uh, that uh, life also is a function of the organization of matter. See, when people used to be vitalists, and they used to say there is a living force, there is the life force, and if you want to explain the difference between living things like us and dead things uh, like rocks and uh, pieces of concrete, then you had to do it in terms of the life force. Well, now we know that that's just not that's not on. I mean, ever since Watson and Crick discovered DNA and since molecular biology has proceeded, it's very clear uh, that uh, that's not the correct explanation of living things. What is the correct explanation has to do with the organization of very complex molecules, proteins, and so on. And uh, I think a similar thing is likely to be the case with regard to the mind and the brain. Um, there isn't a special thing, the mind. The mind just is the brain.